These are my interviews for the film In a Violent Nature with producer Peter Kulpowski and actor Rye Barrett. Like and subscribe for more content like this. Don't get too hung up on reason. They just keep killing. First up is co-producer Peter Kulpowski. Best known as a programmer for Tron After Dark, Fantastic Fest, and Tiff Midnight Madness, Peter Kulpowski's previous producer credits include The Interior, The Void, and Psycho Gorman. He previously worked with director Chris Nash on producing the Z is for Zycode segment of ABC's Of Death 2. Uh, I guess I'll start by asking him, could you talk about your um, history of Chris Nash and how you came to co-produce his feature film debut? <clears throat> Well, uh, my relationship with Chris Nash begins as a curator. Uh, my first year curating short films for the Try Not to Dark Film Festival, which largely was the first time I ever curated any form of uh, cinema, uh, I uh, selected his um, York University short, um, Day of John, which uh, went on to enjoy a really healthy film festival run. And I just was a fan of Chris's. I, you know... Uh, screen the short. I would screen other shorts that, of his that he would make afterwards, uh, particularly his Skinfections trilogy. Um, and uh, we grew to become friends. And it, I remember I was producing a short film for Stephen Costanzi called Biocop. And I was doing a call for extras. And I included Chris on that list. Uh, and he, he was an extra in that film. And he had a really positive experience that only further cemented our uh friendship and uh after that screening or after that um production of biocop he asked me if i was interested in in potentially uh producing his next project and uh he pitched me a, a feature that um is yet to be made that was another project and uh, but i grew very interested in it and helped develop that project and as we continue to develop stuff together i was also a producer on ABCs of Death um, to the Zeus for Zygote segment. And I did that with Shannon Hamner, who had also been producing some of Nash's films and working very closely with him. And uh, yeah, uh, and then and then Violent Nature came along. And, and this was really a case of we had this other project that we were working on. Um, uh, Shannon and I were producing Psycho Gorman. We brought Nash on Psycho Gorman to do effects. And while he was on set, he... Uh, started discussing his idea for a slasher movie with Stephen Kostansky, who liked it a lot and was interested in, in helping on that on the project. And after Psycho Gorman was done, he just went home and and wrote the script, which both Shannon and I really loved. And then it was just a matter of bringing the script to the right partner um, and finding the right supporters for it. Um, and I know Nash had been already interested in doing this project even before Psycho Gorman just by watching Gus Van Sant films and thinking about slow cinema and thinking about the idea of combining these sort of art house aesthetics with, um, with a, a schlocky genre framing device. So I think you partially answered to some. So why did it take so long for Chris Nash to make a feature? <laughs> I would say that, you know, it, it's, it's always different for every filmmaker, but 
Uh, you never know when it's, it's always about timing, I, I suppose. Uh, it was not for lack of trying. We had a number of different projects. We had a project, you know, get very close to being made. Uh, we, um, it was a much more ambitious project than this. And we had a uh, television project as well. And it was in development for a very long time and commanded a lot of his attention. Um, and, uh, and then it was interesting. This was a, a very simple idea though. It was, it was a idea that had ambitious aspects to it, but it felt something that we could achieve easily. And we had, and the timing was right. We had just done Psycho Gorman. So, um, we had, a pr we had proven that this team could pull off a production. And so when we turned around and had something that was both original, but also, you know, a relatively low budget independent production. Um, it provided a per perfect storm for people to trust us and uh, that we could make something interesting and special. Oh, um, so I'm talking about um, low budget independent production. And you don't really expect like a Canadian film, like in, in a violent nature to get as much attention as it has been getting. So are you like surprised about that? I mean, we're very um, thrilled and, and humbled by the attention and the reception to the film. Um, Never mind Canadian. It's just simply rare for a slasher film, this film in this subgenre, to be receiving uh, the the critical appreciation that it has been receiving. Um, but I I do think you know, speaking as a curator, I, I think I think it was a testament to the originality of Chris's vision. Um, certainly, there have been movies made uh, from the perspective of uh, antagonists before. So, uh, I mean. Um, there are films like Behind the Mask or Tucker and Dale versus Evil. We were inspired by Elephant, um, mm -hmm. or, or film a film like Angst. I mean, the, 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 this this device is not entirely original, but there was a commitment to the bit. There was a tone that I think was very original and very striking. I think the fact that the film didn't condescend to its subgenre, but ad rather indulged in its subgenre, was something that I think made it stand out. And I think it was the right timing. I, it's been, a, you know, I've observed myself that there haven't been, there's been a bit of a slow renaissance in the slasher genre and interest in the slasher genre since the reboot of Halloween. But, you know, Nash, Nash was bringing something that I think was not seen in the marketplace, uh, to use a, a crude term. Was, and and I think that's what encouraged and fostered interest in the film because it's a song that to use musical metaphors, it's kind of a song that everyone's familiar with, but it leaves out certain notes and introduces notes that are unusual and, and strange. And I think these were the elements that made it stand out and made people interested in, in checking it out. And then gratefully, so many of them, you know, began to appreciate the film and like the film. And so that's been great too because. It only encouraged and emboldened our distributor, both our Canadian distributor and our American distributor, to give it a serious release. Well, just like I'm amazed, like, you know, I'm like Facebook friends of Fry Barrett and he's hosting like everything to do with the film. And he's like amazed that he's on like the front page of IMDb. No, we're all amazed. Um, I, I mean, I think horror has gone through a lot, a lot of cycles. And sometimes, you know, I, I feel horror films are always profitable. They always make money. They're always, a, a, you know, a good, solid bet. Um, in, in, in industry terms. Um, but there has been definitely a real renaissance of, of industry support and appreciation of the horror genre. I feel like horror films are getting a little bit more real estate than they used to uh, in movie theaters, for instance, uh, as, you know, I think audiences have gotten a little bored uh, with big budget comic book movies. I think there is kind of an interest in, 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 in appreciating and enjoying horror films, so... I think that 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 certainly helped. I think the success of so many of the independent horror films that preceded us, um, you know, even as recently as Skinnermarink, I think really paved mm -hmm. the way um, for uh, distributors to take low budget horror seriously. Well, I guess like the the, the connecting tissue between uh, in a violent nature and Skinnermarink is the distribution by IFC and Shutter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and 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 I think that's you know their success with Skinnermarink that certainly emboldened them to have a. Uh, considerable u.s release yeah so that did that distribution deal come before or after the sundance premiere <laughs> we were uh in talks with shutter before uh the sundance premiere they'd been supporting this project from the very beginning could you really talk about the experiences um shooting the film it was one of the most challenging productions uh, i've ever worked on i think that goes for everyone involved 
it's no secret that we actually ended up shooting the film twice. Um, the first time through, we got about uh, two thirds of the way through the movie, but we were experiencing horrendous weather, uh, equipment malfunction. Um, we had actors that had to leave the production due to medical illnesses. We had the heads of department get exchanged at the last minute. We had um, issues, you know, with wardrobe. And, and uh, at a certain point, it got so uh, challenging that we ended up actually shutting down early to regroup. And in that time, we reviewed the footage and uh, realized that there were things that we would have to return and reshoot. We realized there were certain actors we weren't able to get back again. And so we would have to recast. And invariably, we also realized that the way we were shooting the film, the way we were lighting the creature, the way it even designed Johnny's look, uh, all of that wasn't quite satisfying what Nash's vision was. And so we joked that the first block ended up becoming one of the most expensive pre sessions <laughs> that an independent film has ever done. Um, and, but we, uh, we went back at it about six months later with a tweaked design for Johnny and with a, you know, a different approach to the cinematography and certainly just, you know, a lot of hindsight, uh, that was guiding our hands and, and it was with a pared down, much smaller crew as well. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was quite challenging. And even the second block, we, because we were such a smaller crew, we ended up shooting in multiple chunks. Uh, so we did about four blocks total of shooting and it began in late 2021 and shooting completed in December, 2022. So it was a very, very lengthy period uh, of development and trying things out, trying it again. Um, but I do think that gives the film a certain type of quality to it that uh, I don't think would exist had we not gone, gone through all of that. I don't really want to get into spoilers, but I do have to talk about the kills in the film. Sure. I think there's uh, like one kill in particular that's been getting a lot of attention that people have been just calling it the kill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the movie is, uh, we always envision the film as being a kind of taxonomy of slasher kills. We didn't want all of them to feel the same. We wanted each kill to have a different uh, timbre, a different tone, and kind of encompass the scope of the violence that you see in slasher films. Sometimes the violence is off screen, and sometimes it's completely in your face. Sometimes it's operatic and uh, almost uh, comic book in its, in its uh, elasticity. Other times uh, it's subtle and, uh, you know, as unnerving as, and, and as uncomfortable as a paper cut. Um, so th these were the kinds of notes we wanted to hit and, uh, and yeah, and then the one that became the kill, I mean, that is kind of our tribute to the outrageous kills that, that you might see in an Italian Jalla. Um, and it was a very complicated sequence or, to or, do. Or Jason Voorhees in the latter films. Yeah. Yeah. And some, <laughs> some of the more elaborate Jason films, yeah. um, for sure, for sure. I mean, and, and the Friday the 13th films and the burning uh, you know, all all very key, um, you know, influences on the movie. Uh, absolutely. Uh, that the, the kill, the one that everyone seems to talk about, it was a very complicated kill, uh, but it was it was something that was written in the script beat for beat. And uh, um, it was definitely the, one of the, the, the kills that we knew that we could not not afford to not make work. I and mean, there were some other kills that we did tweak and, ch and change that maybe were too ambitious on the page. But that was a kill that we knew had to be there. It was a very important one. It's very much the midpoint of the movie. Um, I, Nash would say that it, its placement is even very important given, you know, where Johnny is following that sequence, uh, not to spoil things, but we learned a little bit more about Johnny right after that sequence in, in a very specific way. Um, and um, yeah, it was a tough sequence to shoot. It, I, I believe, I believe that sequence was shot over four days but not consecutively they were weeks in between those days in fact um one of the shots in the in that um sequence was shot was the very last thing we shot in december in shannon's backyard um and if you pan to the right or left you would see snow <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh yeah it was it was really a, a granular sequence um, that we worked on to get right. And, you know, some people ask us, well, how did you even come up with it? And it was, you know, Nash has said is it was very organic. It was just, 
he, you know, he had come up with these tools for Johnny to use and he just sort of thought logically how those tools might work and how they would. And, and so it wasn't, it wasn't even in an effort of like, we have to come up with the craziest thing ever. It was just him trying to think of a logical way to kind of use these uh, very unique logging equipment. And uh, that's what we came up with for that sequence. What is um, next for both the film, you, Chris Nash? <laughs> well, we're just going to enjoy the fact that we have an unprecedented opportunity for an independent Canadian slasher film to uh, to reach as, an, as, as large an audience as we're being offered. And, and, and that's just overwhelming and wonderful. And I just hope not even just for the sake of our production, but for other productions that the film does well and performs well and and um, is only further proof that there is an audience that has an appetite for horror and that they, you know, it doesn't need to be hundred million dollar horror. It can be low budget. It can be something in which the ideas are paramount and not necessarily, uh, who, you know, it's not necessarily about who's in it. And it doesn't necessarily need to be tied to a franchise either. I love the, the, all these franchises. I hope they make another Friday the 13th. I hope we continue to see these horror icons from the 80s. But I also hope that, um, the, you know, producers look at this as an opportunity to explore and introduce new um, new monsters and new creatures um, and, to, to, and to take chances and be, you know, and, and, and let horror filmmakers continue to experiment with the genre. Because I think if you look down the line, I think all the, the horror films that have endured were often experiments in the genre to mm -hmm. begin with. Um, and so... As for what's next for this team, uh, I'm working on a few other projects with other filmmakers that I work with. Chris is working on projects as well. A lot of people have asked us if we'll continue to see the adventures of uh, Johnny in the future. And uh, while we can't confirm anything, we've certainly been thinking about it as well. Um, because, you know, the fact that uh, audiences have, have embraced the character and are interested in, in this unique way to uh, tell his story have us also considering, well, what else could we do with this character? And, and how else might we photograph this character again in a unique way? I think if we do continue to make movies with Johnny, um, I think we probably wouldn't repeat ourselves. We would not necessarily make a conventional slasher either, but I think we would find opportunities to do something unique again, um, because I think that's what you know keeps us interested in the genre. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, man. It really means a lot that you mm -hmm. you liked it. Um, yeah. And because uh, I know it's it's a it's a strange movie. It's very slow by design, but I'm I'm really yeah really well, yeah. I know it's the slow parts and the, the but then like I broke down laughing in the <laughs> press good, good. Next up, we have actor Rye Barrett who plays the killer Johnny. The Guelph-born and Toronto-based actor's best-known credits include titular characters in 2014's The Drownsman, 2015's The Demolisher, and 2022's Cult Hero. Okay, so <laughs> let's get started. Um, how did you end up getting cast for what is essentially the Canadian wilderness equivalent of Jason Voorhees? <laughs> Um, well, I had, um, I got in touch, well, Shannon, Shannon Hammer actually uh, sent me an email um, about the film and kind of what the character was and then I, I so I met up with her and uh Chris Nash and just had a little talk about what what the the project was and what the character was and and what was kind of needed and how how the different perspective was going to be in play and everything and and knowing knowing their work and what they'd done in the past and and how uh how, how great their what they've done uh I was just really excited to to be a part of that and to jump on board so for Pretty much the majority of the film, you're either shot from the back of the head or wearing the mask. So how challenging it was to perform a mostly silent and physical role like this? Um, it's yeah, it's it's a different it's a different kind of uh, animal, really. Um, you have to rely on on total uh, physical uh, elements. And I kind of I give myself rules for, for characters like that, um, just specifically for this one, too. And th this was after a lot of talk with with chris as to what exactly johnny was and what kind of character he was but you kind of have to give yourself um some rules and some uh, kind of a checklist that before i started rolling i just go through mentally and and be like all right johnny does this 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 um just to keep it consistent so that throughout the film and and um with all the walking and and from jumping from this scene to this scene and this part of the film to, to this part just to make sure it was all consistent 
and that Johnny would always have the same kind of flow and everything. Um, and then to, you know, add in little bits of flavor and, and nods to, to other past characters, but then doing my best to not copy too much of that and to, to create, uh, like, a an original character himself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge when you can't talk or, uh, really expressed with your face. <laughs> well, I guess we'll talk, talk about the nods to previous characters. So obviously I think most people are going to be comparing In a Violent Nature to Friday the 13th and Jason before he's killed. But, uh, well, Johnny, like, pretty much um, no two kills in the film are actually the same. And so could you talk about the variety of kills in the film? Yeah. Um, so those are all uh, designed and created by Chris Nash, uh, our writer-director. Um he he designed all these kills and you know they're all in, in the script and then they they built the prosthetics and all the effects around how they had to be but i think i think a lot of it was just wanting to be creative and and to do something interesting that that maybe people haven't seen um in either a slasher film or any film for them for that matter and to just you know do something different each time and kind of up the ante um it, to a to a degree there's kind of like a you know an ebb and flow to to the kills too like some of them are extremely complicated and long and other ones are really kind of fast and jarring um so it was kind of keeping that uh sort of a flow for that and then and just you know keeping it entertaining for the audience and doing something different so it didn't just become you know repetitious or the, the same thing over and over again yeah well i was um, previously talking to peter kapelski and he was talking about quote unquote the kill and um <laughs> how that was pretty much um the only kill that chris nash wanted to stay in the film unchanged so could we without spoiling too much talk about filming that one kill scene <laughs> uh so that yeah we're gonna we'll call it the the yoga the yoga <laughs> death the yoga um, death, yeah <laughs> it's kind of what the, the term has become for it i guess um that one yeah that one's it, it's it's crazy it's um it was in the script and it's listed like written line for line exactly as how it showed up on camera. I, and I think they even added a couple little elements to it, like um, without spoiling, <laughs> without going into too much detail. But there's a whole lot like it starts and then it keeps going and there's more layers and more elements to it. And I, I got to sit back and, and watch watch that all unfold. And and that scene in particular took they shot it over the course of um basically almost a year there was a huge gap in between because when we shot the original like lead up to the death uh we were losing light we didn't have time to to do the entire effect and get it finished in the day so we ended up have, having to come back and it didn't fit into the schedule so we ended up coming back i might have been a full year or or like months and months later and they had to you know match the the, the landscape and the growth and everything um and then we did all the the effects um all the, the the practical effects on that day so it was a yeah it was a big big job uh multiple people involved on that and lots and lots of blood and guts and prosthetic limbs and <laughs> everything so i think um with um your career i both compare or um in a violent nature to uh, the Drowns Man, which you made a decade ago, uh, back then you kind of made played like a Freddy Krueger character, and now you're playing a Joseph Voorhees character. So, how would you compare the two? Yeah, no, it's it's funny. They do they're um, they're two kind of slasher. We used we used to call the Drowns Man a splasher movie, <laughs> um, but yeah, they're two two very different characters. But at the same time, there's some similarities too. Just just the the menace and uh, you know physical. Um, very physical roles because the drownsman didn't really speak either. You, you can see much more of his face th through the whole thing, but he didn't really speak much at all. Um, so yeah, it was, it was very, it's always interesting playing characters like this. Cause you, you, you try to separate them and create different um, versions of, 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 you know, different kinds of monsters and creatures, but it still is you in, in the suit or in the makeup and everything. So it's kind of you know there's, there, if you look at a character stacked up against each, each other, they might they kind of might look the same because they're, they're going to have that same physicality. But you you hope that people are going to look at them and differentiate how different they really are. But uh, yeah, Drownsman was fun to play. That one was uh, biggest difference is I was a lot more wet and soggy and cold <laughs> <laughs> during the Drownsman than I was during. In a violent nature, I was generally hot most of the time. Yeah. 
And I, I was wet that one day with in the, in the lake, but um, that was that was a good day to be wet because it was very hot. So, is it more fun for you to play these silent monsters or the more chrismic and char- crazy characters that you play, like uh, in Chamber of Terror or Cult Hero? <laughs> um, you know what? There, it's I love having the um, the options to to be able to play both characters. I think if I was just doing the one all the time it, it might get a little tired um but the the fact that i get to these chances to create these di- totally different kinds of characters and play in completely different types of films um i'm just i'm really lucky off the bat to, to be able to get to do that and with great people and and great teams behind them um but yeah i don't know i can't really pick a favorite um just because they it, it I, I love doing it all so it's so much fun to, to create this kind of a character and then to create this kind of a character and to like constantly being focused on on what the difference is of those and, and how to make them each interesting. Uh, that's a really fun part of acting. Well, uh, OK, so this is a bit of a rhetorical question because I've been seeing all your social media posts. Are you amazed at all the attention in violent theater has been getting? <laughs> I am absolutely blown away with, with the, <laughs> the attention has been getting and like every single day. I get messaged a new thing or, or tagged in something. And I'm just like, this is crazy. This is, this is nuts. And I, and I, I just try to, I'm trying to share everything to help promote the film. But at the same time, I'm like, people must be getting annoyed with my social media posts at this time. Cause I'm like, I'm just sharing so much about the film, but it's like, I'm just trying to share people who are, you know, supporting it and, and promoting it too. So um, yeah, I'm just blown away by how, how much it's getting uh, attention and, and support and, and hopefully love. <laughs> you got to go to Sundance and get fancy portrait photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's it has it has gotten a lot of love too. So I can't say hopefully the love, but yeah, it's about to open to the public in theaters. So we're we're waiting on seeing what that's going to be. You know, it's one of those films where where people are gonna it's gonna be one way or the other. You're gonna absolutely love it, or it's just gonna be not for you at all. <laughs> we're, we're we're ready for both those reactions. Um, we just hope that the ones who love it are, are the louder ones. <laughs> yeah, well, like um, the the press screening last week, I kind of like broke out laughing during the big chaos scene because I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's it's supposed to like there's there's definitely laughs in there and there's mm-hmm. there's comedy in there, so we're glad when people you know realize that too. So okay, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Sean. Okay, take care, man. Okay. In a Violent Nature opens on Friday, May 31st. Get your tickets at one of the URLs shown on screen.